Hi everyone, so back with another case study. Here we have an unconscious victim who was rescued from a rural house fire. You're probably about 45 minutes from uh, the nearest hospital uh, out in the rural area. And this is what you see upon arrival. Fire is there before you, of course, and I'm sure you would stage in a, in a very safe area. Your patient has been removed from the house uh, by fire, firefighters and essentially uh, lifted into your ambulance as you arrive. So you have uh, approximately 20, 25 year old female who was found unconscious inside uh, the smoldering house fire. Uh, she was found in the kitchen. Firefighters dragged her uh, out of there, uh, rapid extrication. Uh, there were reports of an explosion at some point, but the house was smoldering for some time. Yeah, I'm sorry, some of these facts you know already. Uh, it sounds like, according to neighbors, uh, they saw some smoke, called the fire department, um, tried to get into the house. Uh, at that point, there was an explosion and the house was engulfed and firefighters rescued the patient as, as the flames were sort of uh, eating at the house. So uh, you arrive, it's about one in the morning. Your patient is probably about 60 kilos. Uh, you can see obvious facial and chest burns. GCS is four. She responds to pain by withdrawal, and that's about it. Skin is sooty and burnt, uh, even around the, uh, the airway. Uh, the airway does appear to be open. Uh, there is soot around the mouth and nose. There's very weak respiratory efforts, and I'll emphasize that you can hear upper airway strider uh, when she's breathing. Her pulse is a weak and a regular at the radial at 120 a minute, approximately. Physical exam, so this obviously you do a very thorough physical exam, but uh, what you do find is burns to the face in and around the mouth. The oropharynx is red and swollen. Uh, chest and hands are a uh, mix of full and partial thickness burns or second to third degree to burns, depending on how you wish to describe them. And so that's an approximation of the burned area. So I'll leave that to you to try and figure out a percentage of, of the burned area. We'll say it's just for the sake of argument, just the front of the body for, for sake of argument. So weak respiratory efforts, rapid, um, patients moving, uh, very little air, uh, upper airway strident, uh, strident. strider is apparent. And uh, you can also hear wheezes throughout the upper chest. So here's sort of a uh, more full set of uh, vitals. I know I'm moving through this quickly, uh, but uh, of course you can pause and, and go back and, and those sorts of things. And I'm assuming early on you would have done, you know, your appropriate early airway interventions and, and those sorts of things. And I'm, I bet you're uh, telling your uh, partners to start intravenous lines and, and get the stretcher and those sorts of things. And I'm sure you'll have lots to tell me when we when we talk this over about considerations for uh, for other sort of adjacent things you might be doing. So pulse 120, uh, irregular and weak. Uh, respirations uh, 28, uh, rapid, uh, shallow, uh, not moving a lot of air. Blood pressure 76 and 30. I'd like you to remember that. Think about that because we're going to talk about uh, that in a little bit of detail here before I get you going on, on telling me what you want to do. Uh, SpO2 on the first responder device, the less sophisticated device than we have, is showing 98%. Of course, we know that older or less sophisticated SpO2 devices sometimes mistake oxyhemoglobin for carboxyhemoglobin. So you have one of those uh, much better, more sophisticated devices on your life pack uh, that tells you that SpO2 is about 80%. 80 and uh, there's an 18% uh, carboxyhemoglobin uh, on the life path. ETCO2 is about 30, and BGL and temperature uh, as you see them. So we're gonna stop here and just talk about uh, a couple of uh, different protocols here. So one, one is the Burns protocol and uh, is kind of complicated and essentially branches out into a lot of other protocols, and we'll have one other after that. So uh, obviously uh, there, there's various considerations for chemical burns, for, for dressings and wet versus dry. Early on, they talk about airway management. And I would say you maybe have some decisions to make with this patient as, as regards airway management, uh, given sort of signs and symptoms she's exhibiting. Uh, bronchospasm, which often happens with upper airway burns, you, you might wind up uh, treating uh, with, with that protocol on the side as well. 
Um, and systolic blood pressure less than 90, obviously you treat with a shock protocol. Now what I want to emphasize with the blood pressure here is early on, and I know you've heard this before, early on burns do not cause hypotension. So early on, if your patient is hypotensive after experiencing an acute burn, even over quite a lot of uh, body surface area, hypotension, generally speaking, is not due to the burn. Uh, so look for other injuries, look for other reasons the patient is hypotensive, and we'll talk about that in a second. At the moment, your patient appears more or less unconscious, but obviously if they were conscious, you would, you would uh, need to, uh, to think about pain management. And certainly, uh, regardless of whether you're needing to give large fluid boluses to uh, maintain the blood pressure, uh, you should plan on establishing vascular access, hanging some bags, um, and starting uh, a normal saline 500 mils per hour PRN, because these people with any significant burn will start to, to lose fluid and that sort of thing. So really quickly on the, the burn management uh, protocol there. The second protocol is a little Oh, a little less complicated? No, it's quite complicated. So this is something we want you to consider in now, and this is still reasonably new, I would say, I don't know, three or four years. It's a protocol for use of hydroxycobalamin. And uh, so ambulances don't carry uh, this, but uh, fire departments, a lot of uh, lar the larger fire departments and, and perhaps even the rural fire departments may carry this drug. And I've had people say, well, why do the fire departments carry it and why don't the ambulances? And it's because you don't go to every fire, but fire departments go to every fire. So uh, this uh, is, it's, it's kind of been realized over the last you know, decade or so that a lot of the people that we thought died from quote unquote smoke inhalation and uh, severe carbon monoxide poisoning pulled out of these circumstances were dying because, uh, of, like I say, about uh, hypoxia or uh, CO poisoning. And uh, that cyanide poisoning from uh, sort of uh, aerosolization of you know, burned plastic in your house and those sorts of things when it catches on fire was sort of unrecognized or under-recognized. So how cyanide poisoning works is essentially it's a cellular asphyxiant. So similar to um, carbon monoxide poisoning, the SpO2 is a very poor indicator it's not a good indicator at all, actually, if someone has any degree of cyanide poisoning because SpO2 measures simply how much hemoglobin is bound up with oxygen and cyanide works within the cell. It prevents the mitochondria from using ATP, uh, which is sort of the, the energy source of the whole body. And so the cyanide prevents uh, that occurring at a cellular level. It's a cellular asphyxiant. So you may have a nice normal looking SpO2 uh, simply because there's lots of hemoglobin on, on or lots of oxygen on the hemoglobin, but when it gets to the cells, it cannot be used. So have a look at some of these criteria for cyanide poisoning treatment and think about whether your, your patient sort of fulfills the, uh, those or not. Um, yeah, so um, I'm also going to post a video of how you set these things up because they are rarely encountered, but if you arrive at a house fire and have a patient who is experiencing some of these signs, you, uh, you could certainly ask the fire department or you may have firefighters ask you. I've heard of this happening to, uh, to medics out there. The firefighters come and ask, do you need this antidote? So have a look at this protocol and, and think about whether or not you want to engage with it. So back to our patient. Uh, this is just a quick look at uh, what the 12 lead looks like. Quite irregular, as you can see. Um, yeah, and I'll let you interpret that. Ample history, just to, to round out your info on, on your patient, uh, per, per the neighbor that kind of came to watch but couldn't get into the house to rescue the patient. Um, she is allergic to dust and cats. Uh, dusty cats are particularly bad. Uh, she is taking uh, a variety of medications for what she has told her neighbor is a seasonal asthma. Uh, we're uh, unsure when she last ate and we're unsure as to what caused all this other than sort of what we've been told already about the fire. So here we go again.
Uh, please utilize the template to respond to questions. You are welcome to post on the discussion board. Um, if you've already posted two, uh, it's not necessary to, uh, to post anymore, but we'll be discussing this later in the week. Thank you for listening.